Hi, uh, good evening, good morning, whatever time it is, wherever you are. I'm Simon Cropper, I'm the convener of the Graduate Diploma in Psychology at Melbourne University. I also convene first year undergrad and I teach on sensational perception, which is also my research area. What I'm going to do is just go through very quickly a few pictures which basically outline what psychology is, perhaps in a slightly different way than you might expect. Um, to give you a sense of what psychology as an academic discipline is, because you already probably have some idea about what psychology as a profession is given that you want to come and do the grad dip, and I think it's important to get a context and sense of both. Then we will, Rachi and I will answer as many questions as you have, as well as we possibly can. Now, at the beginning of this year, I was teaching the summer school, which if you come and do the full-time grad dip, you will be doing, and David Bowie uh, died. Now, he died actually the night before the first of my lectures. Now, being English, I grew up not with David Bowie, I've never actually met him unfortunately, but he was a big part of my life as I grew up. And I was really quite upset by the fact he died, and I felt it was a great loss to the world, really. And because I tend to bring as much of my uh, I guess academic work into my life and vice versa and I teach in a way that I hope gets people to realize that psychology is everything outside the lecture for all as well as in it. Um, this was the picture I started my course with for a week and it started a conversation with me and the 70 or 80 students that were on that course for quite a while about the influence of people that were part of popular culture throughout your life that you've never actually met and how they did have an effect upon you. So someone that you've never met, that you've just experienced their art or their writing or something, actually has an effect upon who you are. So there are all these tiny fragments of the experiences in your life which make you who you are today. And then the experiences that you have today will make you who you are tomorrow. And that's kind of what we're interested in in psychology. Now, my research area, as I said, is sensation and perception, specifically vision and color vision. And some time ago now, there was this phenomena which um, exploded the Twitter sphere, whatever that might be, um, called the dress. Now, most people do seem to remember the dress still, perhaps unfortunately, perhaps fortunately. But again, this was something else that occurred whilst I was doing actually a first year undergraduate lecture series. Um, Two, or two lectures of 400 plus students and putting up this simple picture a couple of days after the phenomenon happened uh, caused about 20 minutes worth of discussion amongst people about what colour they saw this thing. Now on the day that the dress uh, I suppose hit the, the internet I was uh, phoned or was texted at 8.30 in the morning by my PhD student with this picture and I had no knowledge of it up till then, not having Twitter or anything, and she said, what colour is this dress? I have 30 first years who want to know. My first reaction was, why are you taking 30 first years shopping and why do you want to buy such a horrible dress? But then I realised, or she clarified to me, this was something that was on the internet and the first years were her tutees and they wanted to know what colour that was and why there were people seeing different colours. So for those of you who might not know the dress, <laughs> I feel bad for actually introducing the dress to you in some ways, I have to say, but there seemed to be quite a discrepant perception of a simple and poor photo of a dress such that some people saw it as white and gold and other people saw it as black and blue. Now, that caused this argument amongst people about what it was and then all sorts of amusing suggestions about the fact that if you saw it black and blue then you were one kind of personality and white and gold was another, none of which is actually true at all. But it also created quite a, a significant discussion amongst vision researchers about, well, why is it that people have got such a discrepant view on something that's just a relatively simple picture? Now, we don't know the answer to that. We have some ideas, such that, you know, to do with the fact that the lighting is particularly bright on one side and less so on the other, and that we have to deal with all of these problems. The picture itself is subject to the, uh, the hardware in the camera that took it, and various other things. But 
more generally, the outcome is a recent and extremely good example of the fact that everyone has their own unique version of the world. And this caused people to have an argument, because some people genuinely saw it as black and blue, other people genuinely saw it as white and gold. Many people saw it as something in between. Uh, in addition to that, it also made clear that people were actually interested in this phenomenon, that people do have their own unique version of the world, and that excited vision scientists and psychologists particularly because that's our work, that's what we're interested in. So if suddenly Kanye West and various other people are, then maybe that's a good thing and maybe we're not as boring and old as uh, perhaps sometimes we think we are. But these kinds of things are the sort of apparently quite separate aspects of your daily life which actually are fundamental to the study of psychology and what it is that makes us who we are, how we work, how does the brain work and all of this stuff. And this sort of interest in us each having a unique version of the world and ultimately how do we actually construct our version of reality has, can be rather than kind of illustrated in something like the dress, can be boiled down to a series of experiments to actually measure that. And this is an image from a set of stimuli that we devised recently to see if we could measure whether people, whether you can actually measure that different version of the world. The structure of the image is uh, such that it mimics the statistics of the natural environment well and has the effect of kind of evenly stimulating the whole system. So what happens is you get this input of quite a noisy image. The system is what I've sort of started to call a slave to sense, and it will make sense of whatever is coming in as much as it possibly can, and there are times when you will get that wrong. And what we did is we embedded faces in some of it, in some images like this, and not in others, and asked people whether they saw a face or not. And by doing that, and uh, also asking people a series of questions to examine different personality types, most simply put as well as someone was creative or more creative and sort of, I guess, broadly thinking, more, perhaps more uh, loose in some of their ideas about the world than someone who might be more rigid. Those people who were more creative did tend to see a face in some images when there was none there. Now, under some circumstances, you might say, well, they were hallucinating, which can, in extreme circumstances, actually be quite a problem. However, they were living a perfectly normal and happy life. They were students like you and, or like you might want to be, and yet they hallucinated a face when given a certain image. So essentially that, again, suggests we all see our own version of the world. The vast majority of the time we do agree with one another and don't have arguments about whether a face is there or not, or whether there are stripes on a dress that are black and blue or gold and white. But that's mostly because we're particularly good at dealing with the errors that we make and largely correct them. When we don't correct them, and when there are circumstances such that those errors become amplified, then we could be in a situation whereby we actually start to have an hallucination which is distressing to us in our day-to-day -day life, which obviously is something that psychologists become more and more interested in. So it's that idea, I think it's important to remember that we have to think about how things um, operate normally on a day-to-day -day level in a normal functioning system before, you know, before at least alongside the times that we worry when we consider them as not operating in a, in a standard way. So I think that's, it's, it's, and this is particularly relevant to psychology because yes, you come in wanting to be a psychologist and help someone who is uh, having difficulty with dealing with the rest of the world and perhaps has a reality that's demonstrably different from everyone else's and that's a problem, but in order to be able to do something useful uh, to that and to help them, you've got to know and understand how things work normally and we have to do research in order to find that out. A sort of cyber and inside a different context, something that's become I think quite uh, well discussed and considered in the legal field and also as well as in psychology, is the idea about how much control do we have, how much free will do we have, which of course is a huge and long-lasting philosophical debate, which we won't go into now because we're here for days. But 
the idea of the moral brain is like, did are you completely responsible for everything that you do, and or is there a situation when you can say, it wasn't me, it was my brain that made me do it. Now, personally, I think you're completely responsible for everything you do, but there is a discussion to be had about how much we control we have over our simple decision making and how much is potentially made or decided before we even know about it. And you might well have heard about that. This image is actually from uh, the Guardian website when somebody was trying to argue that uh, an individual who committed several very unpleasant acts was actually not responsible because of their psychological state. So those three examples are quite contemporary. One thing that I do stress throughout all of my teaching and try and remember in my research as well is that this has been going on questions and discussion about this has been going on for a very long period of time. And psychology is one of the oldest academic disciplines around and and uh, therefore there's a huge amount of stuff which largely a lot of which isn't on the internet. You actually have to go to a library before actually hold a book, which I think is a really important thing to experience anyway. Um, and it's worthwhile, I find, constantly remembering that to give a context of where we are now. And this particular quote from William James is something that I find very useful and a really nice and I wouldn't say succinct, because it is one of the longest sentences I've uh, seen in a quote, a way of describing the fundamental and basic question I think of every psychologist, every person who's interested in how we behave. This multitude of ideas existing absolutely, yet clinging together, like dominoes in ceaseless change, or bits of glass in a kaleidoscope. Whence do they get their fantastic laws of clinging, and why do they cling in just the shapes they do? And as far as I'm concerned, that can be applied to why particular neurons connect to one another in a particular way, why particular fragments of an image end up forming the letter S, why it is those letters come together into a word and why that word can mean so much when placed in a paragraph, how we learn to put those fragments together in order to communicate as we develop, and how do all those fragments of individuals work together in a society and what happens when they don't cling together in the way that we expect them to when the world isn't something that everyone is agreeing on and we have differences and when someone feels that they're sufficiently outside for their version of reality to be considered, I suppose, for want of a better word, abnormal. I hate that their description of abnormal and normal, but it's something that's you know, colloquially used. So I think that that describes every aspect of psychology, of which being a psychologist in the terms of a clinical psychologist or a neuropsychologist is just sort of a, a significant but um, a fraction of the whole uh, range of things that are psychology. And as you come in to do the grand dip, then you are doing everything that is psychology and getting a really solid, good grounding in how we think everything works in terms of humans and brains and how we are the individuals and groups that we are and also the times when they don't work in quite the way that we do. So that's my little spiel and uh, if you have any questions, which <laughs> we hope you do, then please ask them. Hello, Rutty, are you there? I'm coming on now. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rati. I'm the Academic Programs Manager for Psychology and I work very closely with Simon. So um, we're here to answer your questions about um, studying psychology at Melbourne. Um, I have a question, Simon, from um, Amber Stevens. Um, hi Amber. Um, she's asking hi. how many years of university, university does it take to become a clinical psychologist? So would you like to answer that, or would you like me to take that? <laughs> well, that depends on uh, uh, how, how, what, how you choose your course. But if you do the full-time grad dip, that's one year. Then you have to do a one-year postgraduate diploma, which is the equivalent of an undergrad honours year. The graduate diploma and the postgraduate diploma are essentially the undergraduate psychology and honours psychology course for people who've done a degree in everything except psychology. So you would do the, all of the undergraduate, exactly the same stuff, 
give or take a couple of extra things, um, in those two years. So that's two years to get to the end of honours. You then apply to go to do a master's, which I believe is a minimum of two years. Is that right, yeah, Rete? Yes. And after those master, after that master's, you can be registered as a psychologist, or is it provisional for one year? So basically, a minimum of four years before you can potentially be registered as a psychologist. Uh, obviously, so, people do go on already. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So it's it's four years um, of study um, plus uh, of, of study in a in a in a accredited sequence plus um, another one year of registrar training, and you get full registration as a clinical psychologist, pretty much. So, sorry, Simon. Continue. No, that was it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So. That's effectively it if you start from the graduate diploma um, and all our courses leading into the clinical pathway are accredited by the Australian Psycholo um, Psych Psychology Accreditation Council so it's pretty um, rigorous um, and we find that a lot of graduate students um, who, who start the, the, the degree in that with, with that mindset are really quite ambitious students and they tend to do quite well in most cases when they go into the clinical pathway. So it, it's a pretty rewarding um, experience for students. I hope that answers your question, Amber. Um, we've got another one um, from an international student. Um, um, so he's hoping to apply for the course, Simon, but he doesn't have an IELTS score. Can he apply? Would you like me to answer that? You can answer that. Yes. Hello, <laughs> Simaj. Yep. Hi, Simaj. Um, so, in order for you to apply for the graduate diploma, um, if you're an international student, which uh, you say you are, um, you will need to provide us with an IELTS score, and you need to have an overall band of um, 6.5 in order to be eligible to apply. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, do we have any more? Kim, do we have any more questions? At the moment, we're still waiting. Simon, do you want to talk about what it's like to study full-time graduate diplomas in psychology yes. um, as a full-time student? So, so the, the full-time grad dip, it's a, it's a year to do all of the undergrad, which if you came into the undergrad, they take three years to do. Now, whilst the undergrad is doing those three years, they are doing other courses as well. However, it's worthwhile considering the, the demands that you are taking on or that you're accepting when you say, I'm going to do all of those in one year. What the, the structure of the course is you come and do the summer school, which is all of first year, the two semesters worth of the first year course in six weeks. One three-week block followed by a week off, then another three-week block. Uh, each day you have lectures from nine till one, and there are a couple of afternoons with optional um, either seminars or other aspects of the course that we, we invite you to attend. Now, most people really enjoy the summer. It is intense. We call it an intense course. But um, that's what I was teaching when I told you about the David Bowie thing. It's kind of, it, it's a very, you know, you're spending between nine and one for four days a week with me, which you know means you'll get sick of me after it, but at least we get a chance to talk about stuff. It's a really nice way to teach. It's incredibly, um, most people do, do very well in the summer and um, actually get a bit of a shock when they go into the two main semesters. So after you've done the summer, you go into semester one with all of the other undergraduates. We, whilst we do know and care who you are, you are actually doing the same courses as the other undergraduates. You have to because of this external accreditation and you're in much bigger lectures and much bigger lab strength. So whilst your tutes, your labs will remain uh, tap capped at 22, some of your lectures will be up to 400 students. Now that can be a bit of a shock after the lovey-dovey huggy summer semester, but uh, I think once you get over that shock, it's, you know, it's not bad at all. But what you do have to remember is you've got to be very careful to plan your workload throughout that year, and we do find, we do, I think to be, you know, we have to be quite upfront and fair at the outset that it's quite hard. It's quite hard because 
there's, you know, intellectually we are quite demanding, not ridiculously, but we are, but there also there's a lot of time that you have to commit to doing the courses and sort of splitting your time between these things. So you need to be good at time management and you also need to be quite committed. In general, we find our graduates are. So I'm certainly not saying that to put you off. I'm just sort of being upfront at the outset so you don't come and moan to me and say this is really hard and you said it would be easy because I'm not going to say that, but it's hard. Um, and at the end, so the end of the that year, so you do summer, semester one, and semester two, you will have done all first, second, and third year courses that the undergraduates normally do and be eligible for entry into what the undergraduates will call honours, what you will call the postgrad dip, when you then do uh, a research project throughout the year and coursework in the two semesters. Again, that's quite a hard year, but we do find that most people find it incredibly rewarding because you're focusing on something on a particular area in your research project. You generally become quite interested in that. You get some ownership of doing some research and a sense of what research in psychology is. And it's mostly the general comment on the honours year is that was really hard, but I really liked it. I got a lot out of it. Um, but don't ask them how it is just before they're about to get their honours thesis in, which they did last week. <laughs> Um, and then you become eligible to apply for the Masters, which is two years of coursework and placements. And again, quite hard, but very rewarding. Excellent. Is that enough, I think so. Um, we have another question, Simon. And uh, this, I think, relates more to people who are interested in attending um, or studying the grad dip while working. Um, so the question is, are there any after-hours classes? Um, so I can take this one. Um, the answer to that is, and feel free to correct me, Simon. Um, the answer to that is yes. Most lectures are timetabled to run in the morning and in the evening. So we accommodate um, both um, cohorts of students, working students and full-time students. Um, the lectures are typically repeated, especially for your first and second year subjects. And they usually run in the morning and the late afternoon. Um, and when we say late afternoon, it, lectures are usually run at either 4.15 or 5.15 p.m. Um, majority of our lectures are recorded, and the purpose of that is that so students can view it through their um, sort of learning, or their online learning um, web uh, sites. We call it the LMS. Um, so any student who's enrolled in the university gets access to this. And if you're enrolled in a subject, you get access to your specific um, LMS sites, and you can see the recordings there. Um, we also have lab classes as part of our um, degree, and so a lot of a lot of our lab classes are scheduled after hours. So you know we we often have lab classes that run until seven thirty in, in the evening, just so we can accommodate mature age students. Um, have I missed anything, Simon? No, I think that's good. Uh, the and as Roddy said, we have the the five fifteen in mean, first year is five fifteen lectures, and a great number of the grad dips do come to that lecture. And um, so generally, it does fit in around a working day, not too badly, because you can get a late shoot. One thing I would, I would never suggest or say support someone who's working full time and trying to do the full time grad dip. It's just not possible. You can do the grad dip part time, which is an option. It isn't an option if you're an overseas student. You have to do the full time, I believe. But you can do yes. the part time if you're not overseas which is um, basically you can choose how quickly you do it. So you could do it in three years, doing the first year courses, then the second and the third, or you could do it in two by some combination of the other courses. And, and you can also uh, enrol for full time, and if you find, as some people do, that there's too much work in the, at the beginning of semester one, you just wind back to part time. Uh, and that's something that I'd encourage people to keep an eye on because the worst thing you can do is keep on going and then it'd be too late for you to withdraw from one course whereas if you just you know as soon as you thought well, this is too much you made the decision to rearrange your timetable and take a bit longer you get so much more out of it and be much happier so you know, that restriction on overseas students is, students is unfortunate uh, and obviously not our choice but the you know, if you do have an option to go part-time, you can fit it well, quite well around work and around family life. 
One thing that we're pretty aware of, obviously, is that grad dip students do have uh, other commitments such as family and work and the need to do those things and we do our best to accommodate those and I'd say largely do quite a good job actually in, in helping you. We like you. <laughs> we have another question um, from Mata Hindri. Um, so the question is can international students apply for the honours program? Uh, not until you've done the graduate diploma. So you have to do the graduate diploma and have done an, if you have done an accredited undergrad in psychology and not honours, you can apply for our honours program, but I don't think, and can, Ruti actually knows more about this than me, whether you can apply with a psychology undergrad from overseas and then apply into our honours program. There might be some way of doing it and we would probably, we would have to assess that on um, a case by case basis. Uh, I'm not sure if we've done that before. Yeah, Do you know, we Rutt have. Yes, we have. So yeah. for the honors okay, program. Good. Yeah, we do so for the honors program, we do accept um, international um, applicants um, from around the world. Um, what the entry requirements is you need to do an equivalent um, three years of uh, on um, an equivalent three year accredited sequence. Um, and you don't necessarily have to get this assessed, but we recommend you do. You get if you have done your degree in an overseas institution, um, you should get your degree assessed by the Australian Psychological Society. We call them the APS, um, just to see if you have the accredited three-year sequence. Um, and if they say yes, it's equivalent, you are more than welcome to apply. Um, the deadline for applying into honours for 2018. Uh, sorry, 2017. The, the closing date is the 31st of October of every year. So you can certainly apply. Um, and if you go onto our website, psychologicalsciences.unimelp.edu.au, you can um, look at the website and find out more information about the structure and the entry requirements um, and what the program, um, sorry, and what what other um, sort of additional supporting documentation you will need to submit as well. Um, so I hope that helps you and answers your question. Excellent. Um, we've got more questions, Simon. Um, so I've got a question here about someone who's um, studied psychology. Um, so. They're saying, they're asking, I've completed a number of psychology subjects in my undergraduate degree. Can I still apply and can I get advanced standing, also known as credit? Yes, as long as you have to go through the process of applying for advanced standing and we look at the courses and then make a decision on a subject by subject basis. The convener decides how equivalent the courses are. Sometimes that's easy. And one of the advantages of external accreditation is if the courses were done in an Australian university that's also accredited for psychology, then it's, a usually, it's usually quite an easy decision to make whether they are equivalent or not. Um, overseas courses, we assess them similarly. It's just often a slightly harder decision. So I guess the short answer is yes, apply. You uh, get documentation of all of the courses you've done and a transcript and apply for credit, advanced standing, and and we'll let you know as soon as we can. Okay. And so the other question that leads on from that is, um, is there a lot of group work or projects uh, when you study with, in the grad group? Uh, there are some. And specifically in the third year course, there's a cap, the capstone course, which is it, it has a, a proportion of group work, quite a big proportion of group work. but. A lot of it, uh, the work you do in groups tends to be about discussion and uh, talking about something rather than actually submitting a group assignment. We do do, you know, we have a proportion of group work, but most of it isn't. Um, it's important that you can work in groups and uh, are able to uh, work with other people, work in a team, but it's also, it's actually notoriously hard to assess uh, group work in terms of individual marks and people do get quite concerned about that understandably um, so we're also very aware of that so yeah you get experience of working in groups but a lot of the work will be 
on your own. And also, you know, there's all of the stuff about plagiarism, so you can't copy other people, and we'll know about it because we're because we're good at that now. And um, so, it's but we make all of that clear, and it's obvious when you can do stuff that's similar. So if you've got a group method in a lab report, then you're all doing the same thing, and that's fine. But all of that's clear and depends on the course you're doing. Okay, so we've got more questions, and it's great. Um, so. This question is about what grades do I need to get into the graduate diploma? All you have to do, in, all you have to have is a bachelor's degree in or equivalent in something other than psychology. We have a, a, an entry assessment panel which uh, considers cases on a, an individual basis and we, we do exactly that. But the I think, I think the only written requirement is that you have a bachelor's degree or equivalent, as I said, in something, but it can't be psychology because obviously that's what you're doing now. Have we got any official changes to that? I know we've been considering this recently, Rutty. Have we got anything officially that's different from that? Well, I think what we'll say, I mean, what we're, we're saying is that because um, we get a lot of people applying for the degree and it's becoming incre increasingly competitive. Um, we have to now rank our applicants to make sure that, um, well, not to make sure, but you know, to ensure that we get the best of whoever we can get. We have a very limited, we have a limited number of places in our degree. So, at the moment, we are looking at, um, it, well, at the moment, it's becoming more competitive um, to get in. So, to be considered for entry, you do need to have a degree. Um, you know, that doesn't have a major in psychology or is not an accredited major. Um, and you need to, if you're an international student, you need to meet the English language requirements, um, which is an IELTS 6.5 or equivalent. Um, and then you'll be assessed accordingly in a pool of applicants. So it's, it's, there is no um, hard and fast rule per se about what will guarantee you entry. Um, and it's the same with our our other degrees, so like the honors degree and the masters in clinical psychology and neuropsychology. Um, we have to rank our applicants in order to make sure that we get the best of what we of of, of the crop. Um, unfortunately, because we do have very limited places in our um, in our degree, that's what we have to do. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, but feel free to. Ask another one if you want. Um, so we have another question here, Simon. Um, are there any scholarships um, for the graduate diploma? I can answer that. Um, <laughs> we don't have any scholarships available for the graduate diploma. Um, we uh, within the faculty of um, that we sit in, which is medicine, dentistry, and health sciences, and we don't have any scholarships for um, within the school to offer. Um, there are some scholarships available um, from the university but they're incredibly competitive. Um, for, um, for the graduate diploma in psychology for the domestic students it uh, is a full fee place so if you do get in um, you will need to apply for fee help uh, if you're an Australian resident, uh, oh sorry Australian citizen. Um, if you're an international student, it's full fee as well. So I hope that answers your question as well. Uh, let me see if we have any more. Yeah. Okay. So there's another one here, uh, Simon. I think this is more for people who are working full time. Can I work while I study? And are there any opportunities in a psychology department to work part time while I study? Yeah, all right. So the first bit of that question is yes, you can work while you study. As I said earlier, you can't you can't do full time a full time grad dip and work any more than very part time. And you'll you'll realise why I say that as you start out. I can't stop you. You could do apply for the full time grad dip, do it and not tell me that you're working, but you'll pretty soon realise that's not possible because you've got to come in to do the grad dip. Now the so you could you can work and do it part time and that works very well for many people. And I think 
some aspects of that are better than doing it full time because you can do the course at a, a slightly more relaxed pace. In terms of work in the department, then um, occasionally there are. It's something that's difficult to predict. It's quite often that people who do want um, research assistance, which is the sort of the standard academic type uh, work that's available uh, at, at that kind of level tend to want uh, people who've actually graduated from at least the undergrad. It's not always the case, and it's completely down to the person who, you know, who's employing you. I, for, I have uh, a student in my lab, an occasional RA, who uh, has been working with me from halfway through her third year just because she wanted to. She started doing it for free, then I felt too guilty, but I had to pay her a bit of money. So uh, it, it happens, it's just... You know, it's certainly not something that uh, we can guarantee. You just have to keep an eye out. Now, we don't have piles of jobs and piles of money to pay everybody, unfortunately. But it's certainly, if you do do it, it's actually really good for your course uh, in terms of, uh, obviously, you get more experience doing whatever it is you're doing. It, it helps you. So, so I hope that answered. I'd like to be able to say, yes, you can all have a part-time position in people's labs and be an RA. That would be lovely. Ah, okay. Mahindri has another question for us. Excellent. Um, do so. Mahindri is wondering: Do we have any tips on selecting a research topic for honors, and how does one decide on a supervisor? Um, I think the best. Right. The I've always felt that possibly the best bit of advice I can give people for honors selection is. You do a project that not only you're interested in, but you see as being tractable for a year's piece of work. That means it's got to be, you know, seem a relatively uh, not small project really, because you, you know, it's got to be done in that time. And you have to, I think, be able to get on with the supervisor. And you will only know that when you kind of know the supervisor a bit from them lecturing to you or something. Obviously, that's hard if you apply for honors from another uni. And uh, I guess the way to get around that is to actually go and meet some of the supervisors, look at the list of projects offered, the ones you're interested in, and go and talk to the supervisors, which is kind of what you could do anyway. Um, there is, uh, I think, an incorrect assumption that you need to do, if you want to go on and do clinical, you need to do a clinical honours project. That is completely incorrect. Uh, you actually just need to do an honours project that you can get a good mark in because, yes, entry into the Masters is even more competitive than entry into honours. Sorry, but it is. Um, and so you just need an honours project that you can do well. And quite often some of the clinical projects, because they're reliant upon particular subject groups, have sometimes more logistical problems and make it maybe a little harder on occasion to get a good marking because of various unforeseen circumstances. So it certainly isn't the case that you need to do a clinical project or that it'll even help you get into clinical. It doesn't. Um, I think it's good to be interested in it, but I think I've also found with students who've done a project with me you know, and it hasn't been their first choice, uh, they actually become quite interested. I think most students become interested in their project just because you're spending time with it. And most projects are you know, basically quite interesting anyway. Um, so certainly there's no trick to it, but uh, so don't believe all the uh, the rumours, that's for sure, about you have to do this in order to get there. That's, that's not, you just have to unfortunately do well. Which, having said that, again, most of our grad dips do. We're a very motivated bunch, and that goes a long way. Yeah, so, I mean, in... Um, so, I mean, ultimately what we, we do tell students is that um, always look for something that you are um, genuinely interested in um, and not be so fixated on what you think is going to guarantee you a pathway into further study because ultimately, and we, we, and we tell students this even at an undergraduate level when, when we get asked, what subjects should I be doing in order to get the best um, to get the, the best guarantee to get into an honors degree or to a master's degree? Um, and ultimately, what we say is that yes, there are subjects you have to study, but you should really be engaged in subjects that 
or research areas that you are passionate about because you generally then tend to do better as a student when you when you're engaged in something you're very passionate about. Um, don't be so fixated on what outcomes it will you think it will guarantee you. Really do something that will drive you and 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 work with someone that. Um, you think that you will work well with, um, which is why Simon, as Simon had said, we would always encourage you to go and meet potential supervisors or at least communicate with them via email to just sort of get a feel of whether what their research area is aligned to what you think you want. So um, that's pretty much it. It's it's really about doing a bit of research on on the people who teach it to our school and this determining whether their area, the field of research is what you're interested in because the research project in honors is, you know, takes up a big chunk of your studies and it matters a lot. Okay. Have I missed anything, Simon? No, no, that's good. Yeah, excellent. Um, so we don't have any other questions at the moment. Um, we have a quick look. Sorry, we just um, I, just got more. I, I don't know if I can think of anything that you, know, you and I have talked about. We, it, it's. I think. I just think most people really enjoy the course, but find it challenging, and you know, occasionally have to change their plans because of that challenge. But. Mm. Uh, I've not met anyone yet who regrets doing it, even when they haven't necessarily gone on from the grad dip into the post grad dip. It isn't the case that you know this is only any it's only going to be any good to you if you go all the way and become a psychologist. Not at all. It's actually a really useful course and an interesting course for lots of reasons. And hey, if you don't go on to be a registered clinical psychologist, you can do something like like me and uh, end up talking to a screen that Eight forty-five at night. So it, it's uh, it's really a, a worthwhile way to spend your time, and uh, pretty much everyone, even if they're having a hard time, would agree with that. They do yeah. to me anyway. They're just frightened of me. <laughs> I'm sure they are. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a good course, and we and in, we certainly since we've been running it, which is for quite a while now. Uh, we actually really appreciate you and the con and the, as students because of what you offer to the whole undergraduate cohort. Because obviously you've got a load of different experience and so have they. And so it makes actually for a really good overall student cohort. I guess I, the other thing as well to sort of explain about the graduate diploma assignment. Um, so it is for us it, effectively. It's the first step. In a pathway, in a in a pathway that is recognised by the accreditation body to become a registered psychologist, um, and you made passing reference to undergraduate students. So maybe we want to talk, you know, just maybe explain a bit more the difference between what the graduate diploma is and the experience versus what it's like to study psychology as an undergraduate student, because effectively what they're doing is studying the same. Um, accredited sequence but as an undergraduate you do it through a bachelor's and as a graduate diploma student you do it in a compressed time and as a graduate diploma student so do you want to speak a bit more about the difference? Um, yeah I mean in some ways there's two sides to it. You're actually doing the same courses as you said and part of the thing that I think I, I have to tell the summer students is uh, whilst they're in, in the summer the two summer semesters they're in a group only of graduate diploma students they then go and get mixed in with all of the undergrads which you know, can be a bit of a shock particularly when there's a lot of undergraduates who are 17, 18 and you might be nearly as old as me and it can be quite a shock also quite pleasant in terms of the content of the course because with this you know we are an externally accredited course and you're doing the same thing but you're not doing all of the other courses that they're doing so you can basically focus on psychology and only psychology we try and arrange it so that the tutes that you're in are mostly graduate diploma students, if that's what you want, or you can go into tutes that aren't necessarily, if that's not something that you, you feel important. And it's a really personal thing. Lots of people actually would rather go in amongst all the undergrads and find it quite uh, refreshing to get, you know, and see 
what people that are 20 years younger than them are thinking about you know, Twitter, the dress, whatever. Um, and I have to, I know that most, a lot of the undergrads actually really appreciate the great dips because of the experience they can offer them. So I think that's a really important interaction. Uh, there are two aspects of the course of the graduate diploma that are different from the undergraduate course because of the course having to be accredited to a level of AQF 8. Was it 8? I think so. 9. Uh, which is, sorry? 9. 9. Isn't that, I thought it was a postgrad. That oh, was sorry, nine. 8. Sorry, Masters is 9. Sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah. Anyway, the, that just basically there are two parts of the uh, two of the subjects where you do a little bit more. One of which is a, a presentation, and the other is an additional assignment, I think, in QM, or maybe it's a presentation in, in the in the stats course, quantitative methods course. Now, um, that's actually overall seemed to be quite uh, an advantage to. The grad dips because it's, a, it's just simply a requirement of it being a graduate diploma, um, but it does give you a really uh, solid grounding in doing a presentation on your group research project, which is always useful, and also gives you a little bit of extra stats, which is very useful when you go into honours. So a huge difference in the two courses. It, it, it's, it's a, it is a small step up, and it's. Um, but it, it doesn't. Uh, there's no disparity between you and the grads, really, and the, but the undergrads, really. And I'd say, in fact, it might even give you a little bit of an advantage because if you're doing a bit of extra, really useful work. Uh, other than that, uh, it's a sort of you kind of get treated, you know, a little bit special, not too special, because otherwise the undergraduates get upset. But you know, you have a room that you have access to, some computers and things, and we. You know, we say hello to you and all that kind of stuff, but then we say hello to the undergrads as well. We love you all, really. Yeah, um, but, but just remember as well for graduate diploma students, um, when it comes to timetabling lab classes and whatnot, um, we do get a priority timetabling. You do get a bit of a preferencing there, yes, because we know that we that you have you know things that you've got to do. You've got to go and pick up your kids from school. And in the same way, if an undergraduate had to do that, we'd be treating them the same. But we're aware of that, and we're, we're as flexible as we possibly can be. And you know, the vast majority of cases, in fact, pretty much all of them that I've been aware of over the last 10 years, we've managed to do it, even if it required fiddling around with some stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we're, look, we're, we're definitely aware that you've got other stuff on, and we want to accommodate that as much as possible. Yeah, so um, I mean, part of why, I mean, so our timetabling schedule is quite rigid, um, and we have um, quite a lot of students studying psychology. Um, and so, what happens is what you will find is that we schedule a lot of lab classes for our big subjects, such as the one that Simon teaches, which is Mind, Brain, and Behavior one. Um, and part of what happens is that we are governed by a, uh, accreditation standards to limit the number of students per lab class. So we're permitted to have only 25 students per class at the very maximum. So as a result, we have to run a lot of lab classes um, across the whole day. And so in doing that, it's a very com complex um, system of timetabling. Um, we, we, we do have a lot of students, especially in Mind, Brain and Behavior 1 and 2, and part of what we do for the grad dips um, is we give you guys preferential timetabling for, you know, for most of your subjects, if like Simon said, because you, Simon says, you, you have lives, you, you work, and a lot of people have to support themselves while they study, um, and so what we try to do is accommodate you um, in a subject where we often have over 1,300 students enrolled. So it's true. Um, and so we, we sort of try to accommodate grad, graduate diploma students as much as possible because we do understand that this is a full-time commitment and while well, you're having a life outside your studies. Um, have I missed anything, Simon? I think so. No, it sounds good. Yep. Okay, cool. So, um, I think that's it. We don't have any more questions. So, 
Um, unless there are any other questions, um, I guess we can wrap it up now. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, as I said, my name is Rati Lo. I'm the Academic Programs Manager for um, the School of Psychological Sciences, and you've had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Simon Cropper in his presentation, and he is the course convener for the Graduate Diploma um, in Psychology. Um, if you have any other questions or you wanted to find out any more information about the school or the degrees that we offer, please go visit our website. It's www.psychologicalsciences.unimelb.edu.au. Thank you very much, and I hope you guys have a wonderful night. Thank you. And thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye, guys.